Kene Mongolo de Boro Cotta Secele de Brina Catoli de Ba, Membra Nambra de Catolo de Bambro No Sotolo de Bombra Nacatelia, Egebo Jacele de Ma, Nengolo de Boro Cotta Secele de Brina Catondo de Bambele de Bohotia. Father, we give you praise and glory for answered prayer. In Jesus' precious name, and every believer says a powerful amen. Father, we come before your word humbly this morning. We come before your word respectfully today and we thank you for the privilege to learn, the privilege to be equipped, the privilege to grow in knowledge and to grow in grace and to abound in the sufficiency of Christ Jesus. Thank you that the eyes of your people's understanding will be flooded with the light of your word. Veils full of clarity comes. Your people built up, equipped, edified, and Jesus glorified. We rejoice that by the end of this service, we'll all be the better for it. We give you praise for answered prayer. In Jesus' precious name, and every believer says a powerful amen. Lift your right hands to heaven, let's release our feet together. As we say these words, I am born of God. I am born of the word. The word of God... Is my nature. I do not struggle to do the world. I do the world naturally. Therefore, today I will understand the word of his grace. I will be built up. By the end of this service, I will never be the same. Never ever be the same again. In Jesus' name. And every believer says a powerful amen. We want to welcome everybody connected to this service by way of Kingdom Life Network, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram. All of you that are connected on social media, I want you to know that we're glad to have everybody connected. Those joining our service for the first time, what a joy to have all of you connected today. We want to welcome you to the Word Feast. We're going to have a great time of teaching and learning and unlearning and relearning the truth of God's Word. The social media community, do me the favor like you've always done, always done. Let's flood the earth with the fragrance of Jesus' grace this morning. Help me share the video on your page. Share with all the groups on your page. Create watch parties. Share the video on Telegram, Monogram. Get them, you know, right onto WhatsApp groups. Let's flood the earth with the truth of Christ. Let's bring hope and good news to the nations of the earth today. We want to welcome all our house centers and campuses. What a joy to have everybody here today. I'm so excited. All of you that are in the building, it's so good to see every one of you. Are you excited about the word of God? Can we give the Lord a shout and celebrate the word this morning? Glory! Amen. Grab a pen, a notebook, and your Bible, and you can be seated with your sweet, smart self this morning as we get into the word of his grace. Praise God. We also want to thank God for, for peace over Nigeria. We declare peace over Nigeria. Peace, peace, peace in Jesus' name. All right, we're looking at the concept of deliverance. The concept of deliverance, and we've been on this in the last few weeks. The concept of deliverance. Our key scripture is 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15 to 16. 2 Timothy 3, 15 to 16. <clears throat> And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation, through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. For instruction in righteousness. The word all scripture, all scripture, is a Greek word, pasa, graphe. Pasa, graphe. It means that you must take everything together. To have an understanding of the scriptures. You must read everything together. From Genesis to Revelation. You must read everything together in context. To have an understanding of the scriptures. Jesus did exactly that in the book of Luke chapter 24. Pay attention. Luke 24 verse number 25. Luke 24 25 to 27. Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. He expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Observe, he took everything in their details. That is, everything must come together. That's how Jesus did Bible study. Beginning at Moses, which is the first five books of the Bible, and all the prophets. He expounded unto them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. He is 
the center of the message of the scriptures. Today, lack of looking at everything together has brought what people call, I have a revelation. You know, have you had people say that? I have a revelation. It's because they are not looking at the scriptures holistically. You know, they are just thinking that there's a way you can disjoin the scriptures. You can, you know, um, you can just pull out anything you want and use it to be your personal revelation. The scriptures are not given for personal revelations. The scriptures have one revelation, the revelation of the Christ. We shall see that in a few minutes. Now, oftentimes, what people do is just take a scripture, like I said, and then build a doctrine around the scripture or build a denomination around one scripture. And that is where we have the problem. Because doing that is doing you know, a disservice to the body of scriptures. So Jesus, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Did you observe? All the prophets, all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Please take note of that. He expounded unto them in all the scriptures. Okay? And all the prophets. That's very instructive. All the scriptures and all the prophets, the things concerning himself. So a good student of the Bible must pay attention to details. You know, you will listen in Bible study you will observe things like in, in, of, day. You know, when you are studying the Bible, take note of those, you know, those things. In, of, day. Take note of tenses. Was, is, will be, was, had, he that had, Tense is like, who hath, 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 delivered. All of that is important in Bible study. Very, very important. There is this confusion that goes on in the body of Christ. And those of you that have been around, maybe you've been, you got born again around the 80s and the 90s. You will know exactly what I'm talking about. And it still spills over to, you know, the, 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 you know into, right into the 20s. Yeah, it spills over right into the 20s. You hear people say, you know, Logos, I have a, I have a rema. A rema, you know, I have a rema. A preacher is preaching and he says something that sounds nice. That's a rema. That's a rema, okay? So they say, I have a rema. Now, I want you to note, they say Logos is the written word. That's what they say. And rema is revelation. They will tell you that, you know. The Logos is the written word. But beyond the Logos, you need a Rema. Because to them, Rema is, a, you know, a revelation. Then they say, I just caught the Rema as he was speaking. I caught the Rema. Now, this is a Bible church. And we teach the word of God strictly without any additions. And it's important for you to be able to know, you know, what that means. So let's examine it. The word Rema is to say or what is said. To say or what is said. We mean word spoken. Word spoken. Logos is what is said. What is said. Rema is word spoken. Logos is what is said. That is, if I say, for example, um, Pastor Victor, go to the bank. Then I say, Pastor Victor, I have money in the bank. Then I say, Nduke walks in the bank. Okay? Nduke walks in the bank. Then I say, Nduke, give to Pastor Victor money for me. Now, each of what I said is Rema. <laughs> each of what I said, both to Pastor Victor, to Nduke, sending Pastor Victor to Nduke, all of that is Rema. Why? Because... I said something. Because I said something. But what I said has to be put together. In order for you to understand all that I said. So when I put together what I said, 
I have to say to them. When I say all of it together, it now makes sense. Putting all that I said together is Logos. What I said is Rema. Did you understand? Putting everything I, put, I said together is Logos. What I said to them individually is Rema. Is it clear? Please, that's very, very important. Logos means the meaning. That's why it was used for Jesus. In John chapter 1, verse 1. You know, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Supposing I said, in the beginning was the later, and the later was with God, and the later was God. Does it make sense? Or, in the beginning was the Bible, and the Bible was with God, and the Bible is God. Does it make sense? It doesn't make sense. So, it has to be, in the beginning was the word. Jesus is called the word because when you put the entire Bible together, you arrive at Jesus. He is the message of the scriptures. So when I put everything together that is being said or was said, then I know what was said. Did you all get that? That's why in John 5, 39, Jesus said, search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. Now the word testify of me will be what? Testify of me will be the logos. The entire scriptures testify of me will be the logos. So Jesus explains the scripture. You know, the meaning explains what was said. The meaning of what was said explains what was said all right very important so the written word graphe graphe the writings grammar please take note the written word is graphe the written word all right the writings the letters the writings is called the grammar all right so we have the grammar we have the graphe we have the logos we have the rema so, grammar is the word that was written. Graphe is the art of writing of the word. The logos is understanding the purpose of or meaning or the thought or the idea. Okay? The meaning, the thought or the idea or understanding the purpose. The word understanding is the word tsunami in the Greek. S-U-N-E-M-I. Tsunami. That is to have the full facts. To have the full facts. The word understanding. Tsunami. To have the full facts. Then the word revelation is another word. Apocalypsis. Apo. Apocalypsis. Apocalypsis has nothing to do with rema or logos. Apocalypse is not connected to Rema or Logos. Apocalypse means to open up or to reveal or to unveil or to show. Apocalypse. Let's explain what I have just said with scripture because um, what I have said now is Greek. All that I said now is Greek. Grammar, graphe, Logos, Rema, Apocalypse, tsunami, all of that is Greek language. Now, so let's look at the scripture and bring it out of the scripture. Observe that Greek language existed before the scriptures were written. That is why they were written in that language. So Greek language is human language that predated the writing of the scriptures. And so when the scriptures was written, that language was used to write the scriptures. Now, so let's get into the Bible and bring out clarity. First Peter chapter 1 verse 10 to 11. First Peter chapter 1 verse 10 to 11. <clears throat> Give us audio on the mic. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify, 
When it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. It testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that will follow. So we understand how we got to this point. This is how we got here. They prophesied. Prophesied means that they said things. They said things. They prophesied. What was the testimony of what they said? The testimony of what they said is the sufferings of Christ and the glory that will follow. That is the testimony of what they said. The sufferings of Christ and the glory that will follow. Now, that will be the meaning of what the prophets prophesied. The sufferings of Christ and the glory that will follow, listen carefully, will be the rhema. The rhema is the sufferings of Christ and the glory that will follow. Because that is the word that was spoken by the prophets. The sufferings of Christ and the glory that will follow. That will be the rhema of the scriptures. The logos of the scriptures is the rhema written to bring out the meaning. Alright? The rhema written to bring out the meaning. That's why Jesus is called the Logos. In the beginning was the Logos. The logic. The logic. God's thinking pattern. Jesus is the thought. The idea. The very idea behind what was written. He is the intent. The purpose. The plan. He is the design. All right, that's why scripture will tell you all things were made for him by him through him. He is the intent behind all that was said and done in the scriptures. So Jesus is the logos, the logos of God. Look at Second Peter chapter 1, verse 19. Please pay attention. This is very fundamental. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Did you observe? He didn't say, we have also many words of prophecies. He said, we have also a more sure word. Word, not words. Word of prophecy. Word of, please, that's very important. We have a more sure word of prophecy. Read on for me. Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart. Now, observe verse 19. is talking about which book of the Bible? Which book of the Bible? A more sure word of prophecy. Which book of the Bible? Huh? The Old Testament. <laughs> All of the Old Testament put together is one prophecy. A more sure word of prophecy. Please pay attention. All of the scripture put together is the more sure word of prophecy. Now, the word more sure word is a single word. It means the fulfillment of things that were said. When you say something is sure, it means things were said that has been fulfilled. You can't talk about the surety of something if it has not been fulfilled. A more sure word of prophecy. Now, he is not saying we have new prophecies. There are no new prophecies to the scriptures. There are no new prophecies to the scriptures. We have a more sure word of of prophecy. That's why he doesn't use prophecies. In plural. He uses a singular prophecy. The Old Testament. The Old Testament is called. The book of prophecy. Prophecy. One single prophecy. The book of prophecy. 39 books put together. Is one prophecy. The book of prophecy. It was prophecy. Prophecy about Jesus. So we have a singular revelation in the scriptures. A singular revelation. It's called the prophecy. Are you in the building? We have a singular revelation. We don't have revelations. We have a singular revelation called the prophecy. Observe. The prophecy. Not prophecy. The 
we have a singular revelation. Read for me verse 20 of 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 20. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. The word interpretation today will be origin. No prophecy of the scripture is of any private origin. No prophecy of the scripture has its own different origin. Or no prophecy of the scripture came from a different source. Source or origin. The word interpretation. Before we explore further, remember context is king in Bible study. Context is king. If you are studying the Bible, context is king. So go back again to 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 19. Please pay attention. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn, and the day star arise in your hearts. So now he's telling you how the Old Testament came about. The Old Testament came about from the prophecy. So verse 21 of that chapter explains verse 20. So let's read verse 21. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 21. For the prophecy came... Did you observe? For the prophecy. Not prophecies. The prophecy. The entire Bible is called the prophecy. We don't have prophecies. So we don't have revelations. Are you in the building? This one here, a preacher say, my own is to preach deliverance. Another preacher say, my own is prosperity. Another preacher say, my own is marital success. Another preacher say, my own is entrepreneurship. Another preacher will say, my own is uh, kata, kata, kata. <laughs> Different things. No, we don't have prophecies. We have one singular message. We have one singular revelation. It is called the prophecy. Not the prophecies. Is it getting clear? Yeah, and this is Peter speaking. Peter, Peter is a foundational apostle. Peter is an apostle of the Lamb. Peter is a guy who saw Jesus. Peter is one of the guys that Jesus handed over to what the New Testament church ought to preach and what the New Testament church ought to practice. And Peter now is saying, look, look, we have Ake Mananga, Libra Naka. You know what Peter was saying? He said, we saw Jesus on the holy mountain. He said, look, I saw him. It's not, it's not just read. We were with him on the holy mountain. When we experience his, his excellent majesty, when we heard the voice that came from heaven, saying, this is my beloved son. We were there. Peter said, I was one of them. It was Peter, James, and John. It was even Peter who said, let's build three tabernacles. Is it not so? One for Jesus, one for, 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 for Elijah and for Moses. It was Peter who said that. Then Peter said, look, with all that I saw, with all that I experienced, with all that I experienced with Jesus, put it aside. We have a more sure word that is better than what we saw, that is better than what we had, that is better than what we experienced. Put all that aside. What the Old Testament documented is the prophecy. Nothing to be added, nothing to be taken out. And he calls it a more sure word. You know why I use that word? A more sure word. Compared to the things we saw and had. What was documented in the 39 books of the Old Testament. Which is a singular message. A singular revelation. And a singular revelation of God called the prophecy. Is a more sure word. Surer than experience. Shorter than visions, shorter than dreams. Oh, I love this. Give me that verse 21 again, please. Read, read verse 21 for me again. For the prophecy came not in old time by the Did will see, of man. It came not in old time by the will of man. That is, nobody just stood up and said, this is the way I see it. This is how I see No, no, no. It came not in old time, talking about the Old Testament, by the will of man. But 
Read on, read on. But, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. One source. All of them spake by the Holy Ghost. One origin, one source, one revelation, one prophecy, one message. Are we in the building? One, singular. Now, pay attention. So what is the interpretation or the origin of the Old Testament? The origin of the Old Testament is the Holy Ghost. The source of the prophecy is the Holy Ghost. So, no prophecy of scripture is of any private origin. The origin of scripture is the Holy Ghost. Look at 2 Timothy 3.16. 2 Timothy 3.16 again. <clears throat> All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. All scripture, all, is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. You know, Jesus calls the whole book, you remember? In his Bible study, the whole book, all the prophets. Beginning at Moses, he says, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. So he called the entire Old Testament, all the prophets. All the prophets. Please pay attention. So in John 1.1, 1, 1, John is writing from a preconceived notion. A preconceived notion. Because John now understands that the entire Old Testament speaks about Jesus. So when John was writing his book of John chapter 1 verse 1, he now says, in the beginning was the Logos. The idea. God's thinking pattern. Yeah. In the beginning was God's purpose. And the purpose, the idea, the thought, the plan was with God. And the logic, the logos, the purpose, the idea, God's thinking pattern was God himself. That's the summary Peter gave. I, I mean, John gave. After looking at the entire books of the Old Testament. And remember, please listen carefully. Remember that the four gospels were written after the epistles. They were not written until the epistles were first written. So John must have read all of the epistles to understand the Old Testament. Then he now said, you know what? In the beginning was the world. And the world was with God. So he calls Jesus the Logos. The Logos. That is, John said Jesus is the interpretation of scripture. Why is John saying that? Because he was present at the Bible study of Jesus in Luke 24, 25, 26, 27 down to 49. He has the explanation of scripture. So he's writing. And he is writing from that preconceived notion. So Jesus, I mean John tells us that Christ is the explanation of the scriptures. Christ is the explanation of the scriptures. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1. Please pay attention. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1 and 2. God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Next verse. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. He hath in these last days spoken, spoken, spoken in his son. So the son is the word. Spoken in his son. So we call Jesus the word. It doesn't mean God's book. It doesn't mean Jesus is God's book. You know? No. The word means he is the reason. The word means the logos. Now, look at this. So, 
the logos will be before the rhema. Because the logos is the idea behind the spoken word. Did you get that? The logos is the idea because Jesus is the logos, the idea. God's thinking pattern. It is the thinking pattern that brought about the speakings of the prophets. Are we in the building here? Yeah. The logos is therefore before the rema. Please stay with me. Before the rema. Logos is, for example, I want good government for Nigeria. I want good government for this country. That's my thought. That's what I am thinking. That thinking in me is the logos. When I say what I am thinking, it will be Rema. Is it clear? Okay, so I'm thinking of good gov gov government for Nigeria. You know, and I'm just thinking, oh, what a wonderful country this will be. I'm thinking now. Just imagine that I'm not talking, okay? What a good government if we have to turn this country around. This country will be so wonderful. So lovely. Everybody will want to come to Nigeria. Look at our land. Look at our vegetation. Look at our oil. Look at our solid minerals. Look at our intellectual properties. Everywhere you go in the world, Nigerians are not left behind. They are in the forefront of every form of, you know, human resource. And I'm thinking... That's Logos. That's my thinking pattern. Then I open my mouth. We need government. Good government for Nigeria. What I said came from what I'm thinking. What I'm thinking is Logos. What I said is Rema. Do you understand? So Rema and Logos are the same. They are not different. I, I just caught the Rema. He's, he's totally ignorant. <laughs> Are we in the building here? The Logos and the Rema are the same. Please stay with me. So that means the Logos precedes the Rema. So I thought it, Logos, before I said it, and when I said it, Rema. So all the Rema was about the Logos. All the Rema was about the Logos. Are you in the building? All the Rema was about the Logos. Look at Colossians chapter 2 verse 16. Colossians chapter 2 verse number 16. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of any holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. Next verse, 17. Which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. But the body is of Christ. So he gives us an idea. He talks about types and shadows. Let no man judge you with meat and drink, a holiday, moon, star, new day, all of that. Let nobody judge you. But the body or the substance or the reality is of Christ. So we have seen Logos. We have seen Rema. Then brother Paul now says, look at Ephesians chapter 3 verse 2. Ephesians chapter 3 verse number 2 and 3. Read for me. If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to me, to you, Lord. If you have heard, oh my goodness. Give me the next verse. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote a four in few words. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. The word mystery is an open secret. Something I said, but you lacked the capacity to understand. I didn't speak it in a mystery. I spoke plain. But your understanding of what I spoke made it a mystery to you. Is it clear? So a mystery is an open secret. It is what I said that you lacked understanding of. Okay? 
All right? It, it, you, know, you, you didn't have the understanding of it. It's not like I was hiding. It's just that you didn't have the capacity to understand what I said. He didn't say, mouth has not spoken. If you observe in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 9. Give me that 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse number 9. But as it is written, I have not seen. Observe, I have not seen. Nor ear heard. Nor ear heard. Neither have entered into the heart of man. Neither have entered into the heart of man. The things which God has prepared for them that love him. The things which God has prepared for them that he loves. Okay. So he says, I have not seen. I, I, ear has not heard. Ear, neither has it entered the heart of man. But he didn't say mouth has not spoken. Did you observe? He didn't include the mouth. Because the Old Testament prophets, their mouth spoke. But their ears and their eyes and their heart did not understand what they were speaking. Are you understanding? So they prophesied and said things that God has prepared for those whom he has, for, for those whom he loves. Now, when did he plan it? The things he planned for us was before the foundation of the world. So, a mystery is an open secret. Something I said, but you didn't understand. You have the words, but you don't have the meaning. See that? An open secret. So, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 2 to 3 again. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 2 to 3. Put it up for me. If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to me to you, Lord. Verse 3. How, how that? that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. He made known unto me the mystery. How? As I by wrote revelation. Afore. And where is that revelation? As I wrote. A four in few words. A four in few words. The mystery is what I wrote before. The mystery is what I wrote before. Genesis to Malachi. Mystery because the prophets received the message but didn't understand it. So they spoke it in mystery. How that by the revelation of the New Testament now, I can look at the mystery and demystify the mystery. The mystery that I wrote are for in few words so that when you read, you may understand the knowledge that brother Paul had in the Old Testament. Hence, the epistles. Which means the epistles were directly taken out of the Old Testament as a revelation of the mystery. Whereby when you read, Whereby when you read. If many Christians will pay attention to reading, they will never be misled. They will never be misled. But if you are lazy to read, then you are a victim for deception. And if it's difficult for you to read, it will be cheap for you to be deceived. Whereby when you read. Because you will never understand till you read. That's why Jesus kept saying, have you not read? Because that's the only way you can be free. Whereby when you read. So, we can say now that the revelation of God is now committed to writing. The revelation of God is now committed to writing for you to read. So that when you read, you may understand. See that. For you to read, so that when you read, you may understand. So, the revelation of God is committed to writing, which means everything God will ever reveal has been revealed in writing. Everything God will ever reveal has been revealed in writing. Are you still in the building? Has been revealed in writing. So, I am supposed to read it. When you read it, you understand. Let me give you an idea of an error I have had before. Some preacher said, 
The reason why the world cannot walk in your life is because all you have is logos. Have you heard that before? The reason why the world cannot walk in your life is because all you have is logos. <laughs> Ignorance. Ignorance can undress anybody in public. That's why you must place a premium on knowledge. The reason why the world cannot walk in your life is because all you have is logos. You need to turn the logos to Rema. <laughs> Let me not laugh. You need to turn the logos to Rema. That's confusion. Total confusion. If you say that in the presence of people who speak Greek, they will just laugh at you. Total laughter. Somebody says, stop quoting the Bible. Let the word become flesh first before you speak it. <laughs> Let the word become what? That's another incarnation. <laughs> people just talk without thinking. Let the word become flesh first before you speak it. The word become flesh. There's only one time the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word becoming flesh is incarnation. Is God becoming a man. Someone preaching on the temptation of Jesus said, the first time Satan came to Jesus, Jesus said, it is written. The second time, Jesus said, it is written. Satan did not go away. Then Jesus got the rhema. Huh? Jesus did what? Jesus got the rhema. Then Jesus said, it is said. What? You are laughing. <laughs> because you have understanding now. <laughs> then Jesus said, it is said. The rhema has come. So the rhema is, it is said. In fact, the preacher said, Jesus said, my father just told me now. It is said. <laughs> when people don't want to read the entire book and get the message of the scriptures, they will be looking for cliches. They'll be looking for short, short slogans that will wow people. And it does not have any, it doesn't have any depth. It doesn't have any understanding in it. You know? So, now, remember, it was first said before it was written. And it is written so it can be spoken. Are we clear? So, to know what Jesus actually said, look at it. In Luke chapter 4, we read verse 4 and verse 8. Please pay attention. Luke chapter 4, verse 4 and 8. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Give me verse 12. Verse 12. Luke 4, 12. And Jesus answering said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. It is said. <laughs> now, all he said was, It is said. It is written, It is said. It is, it is said. Do you understand? Both it is written and it is said because it was said before it was written so it can be spoken. So both it is written and it is said are the same. I don't know if we're in the building. There's nothing like converting the logos to Rema. What kind of thing is that? What kind of thing is that? Because it is said and it is written is the word grammar. Grammar. These are words of the scripture. That's what Jesus meant. When he said it is said, what he meant is these are words of the scripture or these are words that are already written. But remember, before they were written, they were said. Then they were written so they can be spoken. I don't know if it's getting clear here. So both it is said and it is written are the same. Nothing makes it different. So, what was written was first of all said. 
something must have been said before it is written. Is it true? You can't write what has not been said. So the Holy Ghost, Kabadanga Lanama, the Holy Ghost has spoken the written word in a written form. The Holy Ghost has spoken, or has, yes, has spoken the written word in a written form. The Holy Ghost has spoken in the written word in a written form. So what is written is what the Holy Ghost has spoken. So there is nothing different from what the Holy Ghost said and what is written. No difference. The best way to be led by the Spirit is by the written word. That's the best way. That's the best way. Remember Peter, Peter, remember Peter said, forget about our experiences, the things we saw, the things we had on the mountain. We have a more sure word of prophecy. He said, take it to it as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn arise in your hearts. Take heed to what is written. This is brother Peter, you know, putting a disclaimer on all the experiences that they had and those experiences were valid. Yet, brother Peter said, we have not followed cunningly devised fables. When we made known to you the parousia of the Lord, when we made known to you the coming of the Lord, we are not following a scripted, a well-crafted story. Mm -mm. He said, look, put our experiences aside. We have a more sure word of prophecy and you do well that you take heed to it. Are we in the building here? Peter is making you see that nothing is as superior as the written word. Nothing. It's not like converting the written word to the spoken word. Or the logos to the rema. Or the rema to the logos. If you look at the written word, the written word are the words of the Holy Ghost. The written word are the words of the Holy Ghost. If you are led by the written word, you are led by the Spirit. Because all scriptures are given by inspiration of God. That is, they were breathed out by the Spirit of God. Am I teaching good this morning? Yeah. Yeah. Therefore, no scripture has dual meaning. Please say that very loud with me. Everybody want to go? Please say it louder. So two people cannot have two different interpretations for the scripture. The moment that happens, one of them is a liar. The moment somebody is interpreting one verse to Aaron, the other one takes his own interpretation to Abba. Somebody's lying or both of them are lying. No scripture has dual meaning. Please never forget that. Remember, we don't have prophecies. What do we have? The prophecy. <laughs> so, no scripture. I don't even if the man fell from the sky. Dugum! And starts explaining the Bible, eh? different from what we have in context. That person is an evil spirit doing magic. Is an evil spirit doing what? First of all, that he fell from the sky. That he fell. If anybody could have fallen from the sky, it would be Jesus. If anybody could have altered the laws of nature, and suspended nature. It will have been Jesus now. He will have just, phew, bam. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father, but by me. Did you see the way I came? I came from where nobody has gone. I am the light of the world. <laughs> he, and nobody will question it. But you see, God himself subjects himself to the order he has set. Because God is not a criminal. He's not a criminal. He brought himself into the world, incarnated in the womb of a woman for nine months. Delivered. He came out like every human being came out of his mother's womb. 
He didn't, he didn't tamper with the process. Grew like every child. One year, two years, five years, 12 years. He grew. Grew in wisdom, in stature. He grew. He didn't tamper with the process. Because he's not a criminal. He's not. So that a man fell from the sky. Or you, know, you hear of men of God that float in the sky. In their churches and prophesy. They float in the sky and they are prophesying. It's either magic or they are using a scientific technology that the members are all stupid not to notice. You didn't hear what I said. You didn't hear what I said. It's either they are performing magic with witches and wizards and demons or the guy is using a scientific technology that all the members are stupid not to notice. Because a man is not supposed to be floating in the sky. If anybody could have floated in the sky, it would have been Jesus. What Jesus never did, what the apostles never did, we are not permitted to do it. Because the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. The man of God is floating in the sky and the members are like, wow, wow, wow. They are not asking intelligent questions. How is pastor floating in the sky? Where did he get that from? Even in the Old Testament, people, Moses, them, they didn't float in the sky. Even Christ didn't float in the sky. Even at the point of resurrection, when he was wearing a glorified body, he didn't float in the sky. He didn't float. He walked, he entered rooms without window and door. But remember, that's in the glorified body. And even with that, he came to men and spoke to them. Even when they were afraid of him, and trying to, you know, be scared of him. He told them, give me something to eat. True or false? So that he can show them that, look, I'm still a man. The pastor is floating in the sky. And all the members are clapping. Wow, wow, wonderful. Power, power. Ignorance. is sitting in an, on an exalted chair in that church. And, and there's a scientific way a man can float in the sky. There's a scientific way. Next Sunday, if I install it here, you come to church, I will enter service from up here. Then I will come down a little bit and I will say, Leo, the Lord just sent me to you. You know, there's, there's, there's a technology. You don't know. I've seen it. I know there's a technology like that. I was in America some, some, some years ago and we went to a church in California. You know, just before Christmas. And they were doing Christmas Eve. And they were having, I mean, Christmas songs and carol. And then they had these angels floating in the sky. It's about 12 ladies. They were just floating in the sky like angels. Floating in the sky. <laughs> I said to mama, I said, white people's witchcraft <laughs> is, is worse than African one. <laughs> So mama said to me, what is it? I said, can't you see human beings floating in the sky with feather like angels? How did they do it? Mama said, there must be a technology. I said, I will find out this technology so that the day it happens in Africa, I will know that it's that technology they brought. Then we discovered that there are, there are some things in the, in the roof that had chains that were tied to their waist. And those chains were given a color that you cannot notice. So they are, they are moving with the chains. The chains are strong enough to carry a human being and be floating him in the sky. So you are looking, you won't know, and the whole roof is dark and only TV light so that when you look up, you can't see anything. You only see angels. I told my about these people. <laughs> these people have a lot of this thing here. <laughs> are you in the building? A man of God is not supposed to be floating in the sky. You're supposed to walk on the ground <laughs> and teach the word of God. <laughs> Dr. Damina, do you believe in miracles? Why not? Jesus did miracles now, but he never floated. <laughs> Praise God. You guys are making me laugh. I have to close this service. <laughs> All right, now, so if you look at the written word, the written word are the words of the Holy Ghost. Therefore, no scripture has dual meaning. Can we say that one more time? 
Please shout it because our TV audience and radio and all that, everybody needs to hear your voice. Want to go? You know, someone said to me, Dr. Damina, you are too absolute. Your statements, you speak them without giving a room for adjustment. Your statements are too absolute. Why don't you water it down and create flexibility since everybody doesn't know it all? <laughs> my statements are not my statements. They are words from I teach scripture by explaining scripture. True or false? I don't have my own words. You're too absolute. Too absolute? Let me ask all of you a question. Did Jesus die? Did he rise from the dead? What is that? Did Jesus die to pay for sins? What is that? When you believe in Jesus, are you forgiven? What is that? It's a book of absolutes. The Bible is a book of absolutes. So when we teach it, we teach it in its absoluteness. We don't create room. That creating room for flexibility is actually creating room for error. The word is absolute. When you are born again, are you born of the spirit? Huh? Are you sure? What is that? It's a book of absolutes. It doesn't give you room to, to try to imagine. No, you don't read your thoughts into scripture. You allow scripture give you its own thought. It has its own mind. The Bible has its own. Bible study is navigating to go into the mind of the scriptures to see what the scriptures are communicating. That's Bible study. We don't impose on the scriptures. We don't, we don't, we don't impose. We excavate the scriptures to arrive at the mindset of the scriptures. Are you in the building here? We don't innovate. We don't in innovate. We don't create. We excavate. We excavate the scriptures. Because the scriptures have its own mind. So, the Bible is absolute. Scriptures are absolute. And they do not have dual meaning. The Bible doesn't have double interpretation. No. It's a Muslim who said this and that was like a slap on a lot of Christians. A Muslim said this. When something is of divine origin, it cannot have more than one meaning. A Muslim knew that much. Many Christians don't even know that. When something is of divine origin, it doesn't have dual meaning. It doesn't. It will only have one meaning. Because <laughs> God doesn't change his mind. He doesn't change his mind. He's not a son of man that he should repent. And then the Muslim says, otherwise, if it has more than one meaning, it is unreliable. If it has more than one meaning, it is unreliable. If you meet people who are sound in Bible teaching, you will hear the same thing I'm teaching is what they are teaching. No difference. Why? It's one meaning. And the more people grow into the knowledge of proper scripture, proper Bible teaching, you will hear all over the place. Everywhere you turn is the same thing we are all saying. That's exactly the way it ought to be. That's exactly the way it ought to be. Not tied in the village. Designed for the city. 
Which verse are you going to read? Where will you, which verse will you read to support such a thought? I permit you to twist any verse in the Old Testament and use. You won't find. Tied in the village. Designed for the city. Ah, ah. Who tied you in the village? All you need is transport money. You will get to the city. Then you will hear them quote a scripture. The labor of the foolish. We react them all. For he doesn't know how to go to the city. That verse doesn't mean tied in the village. <laughs> Who tied you? Lack of transport. Just get transport. You will be in the city. Sharp, sharp, sharp. True or false. That's all. Between the village and the city is transport fair. Eh? Yes. If it is divine, it will have one meaning. Because it has to be reliable. If something has two meanings, if, so, okay, let me give you an illustration. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. What did God do to prove his love? He gave his son. Eh? And now, his son that has been given becomes a guarantee for eternal life. So when you believe in the son, what do you have? Is there any other meaning to that? That's the only meaning. That's the only meaning. That's the only meaning. The scriptures have just one message. It is called the prophecy. The prophecy. The prophecy. Jesus rose from the dead. Absolute. Jesus is Lord. Absolute. Jesus rules over principalities and powers. Absolute. You are not saved, you go to hell. Absolute. No scripture needs, you know, no scripture needs to be, you know, to be looked at from different points of view. You know, somebody say, you know, Dr. Damina, you your own Bible, you are reading it from the valley. My own, I'm reading from the mountain. What I am seeing is not what you are seeing. Wrong. We are supposed to read from the same place. Nobody is supposed to read from the mountain and nobody is supposed to read from the valley. Nobody is supposed to read the Bible from the rooftop. And nobody is supposed to read the Bible from the toilet. We are all supposed to read it in Christ. All of us are supposed to be in Christ and use Christ to navigate the scriptures. Am I teaching at all? Because Christ is the explanation of the scriptures. The man of God, remember Dr. Damina, all this one you're saying, Bible says we know in part. We know in part. When, but when that is perfect comes, that which is in part shall be, shall, shall, shall be, shall be put off. <laughs> no in part. No, are you together? Are you together? Brother Paul was talking about the operation of the gifts of the spirit. Prophecy, tongues, interpretation of tongues, word of wisdom, word of knowledge. It was in the context of the gifts of the spirit he brought in part. Not the audacity and the integrity of scripture. There's nothing like in part where the knowledge of the scripture is concerned. It's either you know or you don't know. Case closed. Leave that here. Those of us who spend hours studying the Bible, we don't like to hear that kind of statement. Don't tell us that kind of thing. He said, that you know you don't know. And if you don't know, shut up. Come, let's teach you. The Bible is given for you to read and understand. Whereby when you read, you may understand. And if you are not reading, how can you understand? Even those that are reading are not understanding. Understandest thou? Is he not reading? And what did he answer? 
How can I understand? Except your man should get it. But at least he was reading and reading brought him to a place of interpretation. It's because he was reading that when Philip joined the chariot, Philip asked him, are you, you are reading? Do you understand? He said, how can I? Philip started from the same scripture and opened Christ to him. And opened what? Because all scriptures are understood in the light of Christ. Theology is built on Christology. If there's no Christology, there's no theology. Christ is the theology of God. Christ reveals God to us. So we can never know God outside of Christology. Just wait, you will see what I'll be teaching you next this follow this week we're entering. We're going to explore some things. Because, guys, we have the whole world waiting for us. We have the whole in the last few days. I got more and more convinced that the world is in serious darkness. And that this gospel is needed. This gospel is needed. This gospel is needed more than ever before. This gospel is needed more than ever before. The answer to all the global agitations is the gospel of Christ. It's the gospel of Christ. That's the answer. There's no answer anywhere other than the knowledge of Christ. Leave that in. I know what I'm talking about. Give it a little time. You will understand. So, no scripture has dual meaning. We do not have different inter interpretations. Is that clear? I said, is that clear? Yeah. Let me round up. And I'll continue in the next service. Praise God. I say, praise God. Say with me, context is king. Please say it very loud. Can I hear you louder? Conclusively, Obadiah, verse 17. Ah, I'm telling you, I'm enjoying this. Obadiah, Zabadagaya, verse 17. But upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. The house of Jacob shall possess. This is a prophecy of the Old Testament. And we said, Zion in prophecy refers to the kingdom of Christ. It refers. In 2 Samuel 5, 7, where we read as the key scripture, it talks about David's stronghold. It refers to the city of Zion. And that's the first time you find the word Zion in scripture. And then in prophecy, Zion means the kingdom. The kingdom, remember? Kingdom means the king's domain. So the king is in the kingdom. Anywhere you find the king, you have the kingdom. So Zion was David's kingdom from where David ruled over Israel. Zion, that's prophecy. So Zion in the physical was a typology of the kingdom of Christ. It was a type and shadow. That's why you will hear Peter quoting it in First Peter chapter two verse six. First Peter chapter two verse number six. First Peter chapter two verse number six. Wherefore also it is contained in the Scripture: Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious. And he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. He that believeth on him. So the the stone is a him. The stone that is laid in Zion is a him. Now, Isaiah 28, 16 is where Peter was quoting from. You can write that for further reference. Isaiah 28, verse 16. So we said, there shall be deliverance upon Mount Zion. Is the word peleta. Peleta. P-E-L-E-T-A-H. That's the Hebrew word for upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance. Which means upon Mount Zion shall be the delivered lots. He didn't say upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance service. He didn't say upon Mount, he didn't say in Zion shall be deliverance service or deliverance activity. Mm -mm. Deliverance is not a service. Deliverance is not an activity. Upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance is the word peleta. It means the delivered ones shall be assembled in Zion. It means upon Zion shall be the escaped lot. Meaning that those that are in Zion have been delivered. You don't come to Zion for deliverance. Once you are in Zion, you've been delivered. Zion is not where deliverance happens. Deliverance happens before Zion. 
When you finally arrive in Zion, you've been delivered. I don't know if I'm talking to somebody here. Upon Mount Zion shall be Peleta. Shall be Peleta. Please, that's very important. It means an escaped lot. So you don't get delivered in Zion. You are in Zion because you are delivered. The word Peleta means you are rescued into Zion. You are rescued. Kabayada. I close. Hebrews 12, 22. Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 22. Hebrews 12, 22. Read on for me. But you are come unto Mount Zion. You are come. He didn't say you will come. You are come to Mount Zion. You are come. You are come. Yeah, read on. And unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. You are come to Zion. Where is Zion? The city of the living God. Zion is the city of God. Zion is the city of God. That is where you are come. That is where you are now. Three things happen in Zion. Those in Zion are delivered. Two, those in Zion have an inheritance they possess. Three, those in Zion are holy. They are set apart. They are set apart. Are you in Zion? Forgive me, I said that was the last scripture. Let me read the last one. This thing is sweet in me. Hebrews. <laughs> oh, glory to God. You know, a good preacher will tell you the uh, last one three to four times. Somebody says, how? You know, brother Paul. I mean, not brother Paul. The writer of Hebrews. The writer of Hebrews. The writer of Hebrews. Are you following? The writer of Hebrews. Wait, give me that Hebrews chapter 8 verse 1. See something. Hebrews 8 1. He says, read, read for me. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. So the writer of Hebrews started saying, in chapter 8, I'm summarizing. Sum means summary. This is a summary of all I've been saying from chapter 1 to 7. Let me summarize in chapter 8. Then he enters chapter 9, chapter 10, chapter 11, chapter 12. He's still summarizing. <laughs> this thing can be sweet, I tell you the truth. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 2 verse 10, let me close this service. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 10, put it up, read on for me. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. Next verse. Next verse. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. Yeah. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Both he that sanctifieth and they that are sanctified are all of one. In Zion, you are holy, sanctified. The word holy means set apart. The word holy doesn't mean you don't make mistakes. Uh -uh. It means you are in a crowd. Then you were removed from the crowd and separated. That out of separation is called holy. Are you following? If you remember in Israel, animals were called holy. Plates were called holy. The ground was called holy. Israel, as, ho as sinful as they were as a nation, they were called holy. So holiness doesn't mean sinlessness. Holiness means set apart. Remember, you are a chosen generation. A holy nation. A peculiar people call out. That's holiness. Say, I'm holy. Stand on your feet. Say, I'm as holy as Jesus. I'm set apart unto God. Say, I am delivered from darkness. I am translated into the kingdom of his dear son. Say, where I am in Christ, no oppression, no attacks, no satanic oppression, no sin, no condemnation. Where I am, I am in authority. I'm righteous. I am holy. I am sanctified. I am accepted in the beloved. I am a trophy of his resurrection. I am the proof that Jesus rose from the dead. His victory is my victory. What could not defeat him cannot defeat me. Where he is, I am. What he has, I have. As he is, so am I in the 
this world. Go ahead and celebrate this morning, I tell you. Woo! Glory! Glory! Shout yes! Woo! I tell you, man. When you think of these realities, you look at the devil and tell him, get lost. Only once. How many times? Only once. You don't repeat it. Mm -mm. You don't repeat it. Get lost. And the devil knows enough. Before you land lost, he's gone. Resist the devil, he will what? He will walk away. Resist the devil, he will catwalk. Eh? He will... Glory to God. The devil cannot argue with a believer in authority. Sickness cannot argue with a believer in authority. That's why when you say to sickness, out, out is... It's not negotiation. We are not negotiating. We are not looking for a common ground. The only common ground is my instruction. Out, body be healed, is healed. Can I hear powerful amen? amen. Say it again very loud. I'm in authority here. Amen. Glory to God. Father, we pray for everybody under the sound of my voice in this building, on television, on, on radio, those watching online, all our campuses, all our house centers, everyone following this ministry, including those that joined us for the first time today. We declare that revelation knowledge grows big on your inside until nothing else matters. In the name of Jesus, barriers terminated. Every mindset that contradicts the truth of the gospel, we cast down. In the name of Jesus. And we command clarity to rise. Clarity, clarity, revelation, knowledge, understanding, breaking forth in your mind. And we take authority over sickness, disease, and oppression of the enemy. And we serve the devil in notice out in the name of Jesus. Sick bodies be healed. Be healed. Be healed in the name of Jesus. You fear. Fear of death. Fear of the future. Fear of disaster. Stop out in the name of Jesus. Mekato Melida. Rakuta Baraka. Legida Noguza. Megere Nakata. Hey! Shotolaba. 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 I decree that you are far from oppression in the name of Jesus. And I declare that you are free from fear. You are the sound mind. And you are kept, preserved, protected, secure. Lapatanangaga, secured, Malegadaga, no weapon formed against you prospers in the name of Jesus. Hey, Malogadaga, your steps are ordered by the Lord. Your steps, your steps are ordered by the Lord. You navigate where the devil cannot trap you in the name of Jesus. Great grace is upon you today in Jesus' precious name. And every believer says that amen on a note of finality. Amen. Glory, amen. Now listen, I want to take up your offerings, but remember, next Sunday, the 1st of November, will be our official resumption of church service. So every power citizen, anywhere you are, we are back full blast from next Sunday. Satan will hear, he will hear keke, correct one. He will feel it as the brethren come back together and we begin to fellowship and begin to pray together. And I'm an angala. I'm looking forward. Are you looking forward to it? We're gonna have a, we're go, we're gonna have a great time. Now, listen quickly before I take up your offerings. You don't want to miss what I'm gonna be teaching this week. Uh, because of the riots in town and the curfew, I couldn't do live services yesterday and the day after. I could have done it at home, but because the things we teach you here are things we want to keep on record for generations to come. Because the word of God is eternal. And what we teach you is the eternal truth of God's word. So we want to make sure they are well recorded, both for TV broadcasts, for radio broadcasts, because the whole world is gone, you know, is gone that way. We don't want to waste materials. I didn't want to sit down on a chair and just talk, because it will not fit into the series for television and for other media platforms. So we just rebroadcasted. But this week, we're going to be live through the week. And you don't want to miss what I'm going to be teaching. I'm going to use tomorrow and next tomorrow to conclude the series on deliverance. Then from Wednesday, from Wednesday, and you don't want to miss what I'm going to be teaching tomorrow and next on this deliverance because there are some areas I want to enter and deal with a number of things, especially where it has to do with human wickedness. When people plan against you, what do you do? When somebody is always looking for how to harm you and hurt you, what do you do? 
you know, those kind of things. We're going to be talking about them. People anger you and they are always stepping on your toe to provoke you. How do you handle such in the light of the New Testament? So I'm going to get into that area of the teachings tomorrow and Tuesday. But from Wednesday, we're going to start a teaching series and I want everybody to mobilize as many people as possible to be part of it. Why do things happen the way they happen? That's what we're going to start talking about on Wednesday. You know, why, why do we have disasters, tsunamis? Why do we have, you know, um, evil? Why do we have wars? Why, why, where did they start from? Why do we have languages? Well, is it God that gave us languages? We're going to examine all of that in the Bible. Why do we have different colors? White, blue, dark, white man, black man. Why do we have all that? Is it God that divided us by giving us colors? We're going to get into all of that. Where do babies come from? Why are some children born blind? Some are born with bow leg. Why are some children born without eyes? Why are some children born without ears? Did they come from God? Does God really give children? Where do children come from? And where do children go? We're going to look at a number of very silent issues, but doctrinally explained. And we're going to do a lot of teaching on all of that. And we're going to get into a lot of different areas of teaching from the word of God. Are you excited about it? It's going to be exciting. You don't want to miss what we're going to look at this week. So, Get yourself, get up your loins and get ready. Tell more people to be part of this. Amen. I'm just preparing you. So we're going to do two days of deliverance. Then we move into why do things happen the way they happen on the earth. Amen. I didn't hear your amen. amen. <laughs> All right. I'd like you to grab your offerings. I want to take up your offerings. We give in honor. We give in faith. We give to promote the work of God. We give because God has given to us. There's nothing we have that God didn't give us. We are not giving to be blessed. We are already blessed. Our giving is in response to the blessing we have. And listen carefully, men and women. We have a huge responsibility to reach the world with the gospel like never before. Huge responsibility to reach people. The devil is walking around the clock, killing, maiming, taking people's lives out of this world. And the devil is in a hurry to get people out of this world without Christ. So he can have them in hell. We are the only voice that God has on it. We are the only hand that God has on it. We are the only witness that God has on it. So we must double up. Double up our efforts. We must double up evangelism. We must double up getting the world. I'm telling you, we need to more than ever before. So that we can, we can tame the devil. We can tame him. See, we can tame him. Because when you see a lot of evil happening, it's because the gospel has not been preached. The devil is in the hearts of men carrying out evil. But when those hearts are possessed by Christ, the devil can't walk in those hearts. So the more we push the gospel out, the more the devil loses grounds. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. The more he loses grounds. And that's why we give. We give because in, we are intentional about getting the gospel out where the people are. So I'd like you to, you know, with a sense of responsibility, grab your offerings this morning, your kingdom investments, your partnership, everything that you want to give to this ministry to support what we do so we can, we can be louder. We can be very loud all over the world. You know, we can be very loud, pumping the light of Christ in the dark areas of our world. Get out your offerings. Let's pray. Father, thank you for everybody giving. Those giving online, those giving on television, those giving in the campuses, those making direct transfers, and those that are giving physically here in the building and in this city. I want to thank you for everybody this morning. I ask that our offerings are a sweet smell before you. And I pray for everyone giving, that even at this time, your people are strategically positioned to make wealth, to make money, opportunities, ideas, concepts, insights are released to you today in the name of Jesus. This week is a week of favor. This week your steps are ordered. And this week we decree that you will seize opportunities. You have all that you need to make all the wealth you need to make in the name of Jesus. Great grace is upon you in Jesus' precious name. And every believer says that amen on a note of finality. Hey guys, I'm about to sign off. You don't want to miss what I'm going to be teaching at 11 o'clock as we continue teaching 
the things we are teaching on the concept of deliverance. And at the 11 o'clock service, Mr. Michael Bush will join me. We will read your emails, respond to your issues, answer your calls, and answer all your doctrinal questions at the 11 o'clock service. You don't want to miss it for anything else. We love you guys. And until I connect with you in a few, you know, in a few, we love you. Enjoy the grace of Christ. Let's celebrate viewers around the world for being a part of this service this morning. Glory! Amen! Woo! This message for these all the messages and books by Dr. Abel Damina. Please call plus 234-806-800-9939 or email powercityoffice at gmail.com.